now that I've completed the book uh, Yom Suf, I've been going back through the book of Exodus. Just kind of felt it in my heart to go back and read through the book of Exodus. And I wanted to bring to your attention some interesting uh, points from the Torah on, on the, um, right from the beginning of, of the book of Exodus. For my Jewish brethren, uh, um, this video is, is, will be a, of a help for us as well, but there's some strong things that need to be said that I see here uh, concerning the Christian people as well. And I want to, to, to mention to my Jewish brethren, we realize that, uh, well, I should say like this here, the, 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 the blessed rabbis in the Midrash and the, and the Talmud comment that Moses is a contrast to the story, uh, to the story of Joseph uh, because uh, our, our rabbis say that Joseph was, uh, when he was in bondage, he did not deny the fact that he was Jewish, whereas Moses, when he went down um, into Pharaoh, or went into Pharaoh's house, he you know, hid the fact that he was, was a Hebrew. And, of course, they state that Joseph was buried in the Promised Land, and this is why Moses did not make it in. I, I have to differ with that, though. It, it is not a contrast, but in fact, the types of Moses and Joseph both are identical in the fact that when they tried, they were both spiritual men, called men of God to do what they did, and yet both these men are rejected of their own people. Our, our people rejected them. Joseph's brothers rejected him and sold him out to the Ishmaelites. He goes down into, um, into Egypt. Moses, uh, in this case here, it's not when he goes into Pharaoh's house that he's rejected, but it's when he tries to come and, and let his brethren know that, that he realizes he's called for deliverance. And he kills an Egyptian in the, in the, in the course of this, and uh, when he tries to tell his brethren, why are you fighting against one another, uh, they say to him, are you going to slay, slay us like you did the Egyptians? So the fear of this then sets in on Moses, and he has to flee into, into the land of Midian. Uh, uh, and of course there, just as Joseph did, Joseph while he was in Egypt took a Gentile bride, Moses takes a Gentile bride as well, and it is later in time that he comes back, and that is the time when Israel is ready to receive them, the same with Joseph. But that's not the point I wanted to bring up to you in this, I want to just kind of set the stage for my Jewish brethren, but this is a more important thing probably for the Christian people to take serious note of. And after the Lord dealt with me on this, I, I did do a little research on the internet. I saw that I wasn't the first person to come up with this thought, uh, or at least maybe in partial there are people that, that have come up with, with this um, uh, same revelation, or similar to it, I should say. Uh, now, the idea of Moses being a type of, of Jesus, that's nothing unusual. But this is the point I wanted to bring out. When Moses goes down into Midian, we find here, he says here in, in um, Exodus chapter 2, The minister of Midian, Midian had seven daughters. They came and drew water and filled the tr uh, troughs to water their father's sheep. The shepherds came and drove them away. Moses got up and saved them and watered their sheep. They came to Raul, their father. Uh, he said, How could you come so quickly today? They replied, An Egyptian man saved us from the shepherds and he even drew water for us and watered the sheep. Uh, he said to the daughters then, Where is he? Why did you leave the man? Summon him and let him eat bread. Moses desired to dwell with the man, and he gave uh, his daughter Zipporah to Moses. It's fascinating to me that, that this man has seven daughters. Now, it, it, even amongst our rabbis, we, we recognize the fact that the daughters are not accepted by the other shepherds. So, though uh, Jethro or Raul, of course there is a de some debate over that, is Raul the grandfather actually, which still would have been called the father, uh, and Jethro the actual biological father of the daughters, or is it the fact that Jethro had uh, is known by more than one name? That's uh, kind of up for debate there, but that's not the point we want to make here. But, there is some suggestion that the reason why in, in rabbinical minds is that uh, 
that what happens here is that Raul has taken the stand with, with one God. And so therefore, there's a contention between the other shepherds who still believe in pagan gods, multiple gods, and, and the daughters of uh, Raul, uh, the seven daughters. Now, I find the fact that, there's, that he has seven daughters of an interest as well, though, because we find in the book of Revelation, John speaks of the seven churches in Asia Minor. Now, Dr. Chuck Missler points out that those seven churches in Asia Minor harmonically are much like the history of the church that has come down through time. If when you read the, the, the way the churches are there and when John speaks of them and, and the issues about them, it very much types the churches that come down through the history, even into the, to the day we're living in now. Um, it would be uh, like the Laodicean church where they were lukewarm. They were neither cold, they were hot. And so God was just really fed up with that particular uh, church in, in Asia Minor. But the point that's fascinating to me here is that Moses comes and he has to drive back the shepherds because they're bullying their way in. And it's so true today when we look at the, I mean, you, all you have to do is turn on your television and see ministers on today, supposedly Christian ministers. And remember, these daughters are Gentiles. And if they type the church, and if they type like the churches of Asia Minor, which were the first churches that believed that Jesus was Moshiach ben David, then what do we have here? We have um, the church trying to get to the water. The water, the, the well water there is, is a representation of the word of God, the waters of life. And yet here's these other shepherds. They don't believe in one, the one God of Israel, and they are trying to push away the daughters of Raul. The, and, and, and we do find out later when, when, when Jethro comes to Moses and he brings back his wife and his sons with him, which is kind of ironic in itself. Uh, just like uh, with Joseph, when Joseph is, in the, is, in, um, is preparing to reveal himself to his brother and he dismisses everyone from his presence, including his, his wife is not there, his sons are not there, and the only one there is now his brethren, and he's going to reveal himself that he is Joseph after all, and them selling him out was the hand of Almighty God. And when Moses goes down into Egypt, now his wife is, watch this now, his wife goes with him, and she does see those miracles. So it makes me wonder then, if we look at the Christian people, and we see that there is a bride that Jesus came to call for himself, it appears from the types that we see here that that Christian church may in fact see the beginning of the two witnesses. Because Moses takes his wife with him, she undoubtedly sees some of these miracles that take place in the beginning. Now maybe not the entire part, but partially. And then she is sent back. Somewhere along the way, Moses sends her back and, of course, Jethro, when he comes later, the children of Israel have already been brought out. They're now uh, serving God. And he brings his, uh, Moses' wife with him and his sons. And he testifies to the fact uh, that he had heard about the miracles that had been done in Egypt. Now, how did he hear about it if it hadn't have been his wife was there? Uh, that's kind of uh, speculatory a little bit. But, there, you know, something, a conjecture. But we should take a look at this. And also, the reason why, because we look at the type that here Moses is, he himself is the one that drives back these false, or these shepherds that are believing in pagan gods to allow, again, the daughters of Jethro, or Raul, to come and to water their flocks, and he himself draws the water for them. You know, like I said, you turn on the television, I am amazed at the nonsense that ministers are saying. Uh, we got these doctrines like two brides. Jesus has a bride and, and Jehovah has a bride. Israel is Jehovah's bride and, uh, or, or excuse me, uh, yeah, Israel is Jehovah's bride and, and now we, Jesus has his own bride, uh, which is the Gentile church. Uh, have we ever considered the nonsense of the teachings like this? 
I mean, what right by Levitical law? This, no, no wonder why Jews can't accept some of the nonsense that we see. If Jesus coming down to redeem, redeem is to bring something back. And when he comes to redeem Israel, he comes to Israel first. Not all of Israel rejected his message. The, the, you had the 12 apostles. We see one place, 3,000 believe, and, and, so many, and so many are receiving the Holy Spirit. And, they, you know, they are becoming the bride of Christ. Now, if, if Jehovah is one God and Jesus is some other God, then, then what's happening here then? Because if they belong, if the Jews of Jesus' day, when he came and he brought the gospel message to them, he brought deliverance, he brought uh, restoring back the life, the Holy Spirit that had been lost. What right, if Jehovah is some other God and Jesus is some other God, what right did Jesus have to take his own father's wife? Answer me that. It, it doesn't make sense. Where, where is this nonsense coming from? It's just like the shepherds that were trying to drive back the daughters of Rahul away from the well. They believed in, they believed in multiple gods. They had, who knows, three, four, five, six, seven. I have no idea how many they had themselves. But yet, they, the odd thing is they're trying to, to drink from the same well, the same word. But they, they didn't believe in the one God of Israel. You know, truly, Jesus is the Son of God. I would agree with that. And this part of him, the flesh side of him, is the Son of God. But what was dwelling within him was none other than Hashem. It was God's own life in him that he came himself to redeem back his bride. Israel rejected it only for a season. I told you that last time I was with you, that, that the, the, the law of jealousy. He takes a no people, the Gentile, only to provoke Israel to jealousy. And, and that should tell us right there, God himself said he would take a no people to provoke them to jealousy. So how could, that, that in itself should tell us there's no such thing as a two bride, this two bride doctrine idea. And so Jesus is coming, packing with him the Spirit of God in order to put it back in the people in order to redeem, for, for God to be able to redeem his bride to himself. And when Israel, when Jesus stands up on the, on the, on the mountain, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. This is not a divorce. He's merely declaring that God is having to separate from them because they won't receive him. And of course, they couldn't receive him. Had they received him, then he would have never been crucified. The lamb had not been offered as a sacrifice. Then nobody would have made it. But Jesus had to play that part. He was God's lamb. But it was God inside of him. And in order, when he was sacrificed, it, that sacrifice was able to release the life of God that was inside of him to come back upon us, to redeem Israel. That's why the first part of the bride was Jews. And for nearly a hundred years, it was almost completely Jews. I mean, yes, we, we started seeing 56 years later when Paul turned to the Gentiles. We began to see part of a Gentile bride coming in as well. But it was Jehovah God himself inside of Jesus, the Son of God, to redeem back his bride. And, and we, Moses and Elijah are to return in this last day. You know, God has to send two witnesses. Why? Because these preachers that we have nowadays, they, they certainly are, are not taking people back to the Word with one God. They're taking the people back with their pagan ideas, trying to get their sheep to feed on this. So Moses and Elijah come to Israel to bear witness that Jesus Christ indeed was God in human form, like he was before Abraham. And 
not and don't misunderstand me I'm, I'm not a oneness when I tell you this but the thing is is that Hashem is able to manifest itself in different ways just like we see at the burning bush you know this is why we have the word Elohim Elohim is plural it doesn't mean that there's multiple gods if it does then why does it say Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Hear O Israel the Lord thy God is one God it's because God can manifest himself in whichever way he chooses to do when when God was uh, I mean the Christian Bible says that Jesus that everything was that was that was 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 created by him and nothing exists except the what he created was it in the Sun form no it was God himself creating Jesus says, I come from God, I go back to God. The pillar of fire, that, that, that when, when it says the angel came down and it was Hashem that spoke from the midst of the bush, it shows that it was Hashem, Yahweh, in the middle of the fire. When Jesus was on earth, it was just Hashem living inside of that human body. God come to redeem his own bride. And then we see these believers. They're trying to get to the word. They're trying to water their sheep. They, they believe that, 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 you know, and of course we find later, as I said, that Jethro, he comes down and he agrees that the God of Israel, he is the almighty God. He is the one God. He, he forsakes paganism and accepts the true one God of Israel. And when the two witnesses come, I'm beginning to, as I see these types and shadows that are laying in here, it is looking more as if God himself, you know, I know that there's people that believe in pre-trib rapture, post-trib, mid-trib, all kind of, you know, post-trib does, does, just does not make sense whatsoever. I believe that the bride of Christ will go before tribulation sets in. Before Christ reveals himself to the Jews that he is indeed, or was indeed, Moshiach bin David. I do believe that. But the question is, is when the two witnesses come on the scene, will the bride actually possibly see part of that? I can't say for sure. There are little clues in there that kind of appear that way. Because here we have Moses himself driving back the shepherds so that the true church can once again drink from the well, from the water that God had provided for them. And he has to drive back the false shepherds. There's going to come a time, my brothers and my sisters, somebody's got to take a stand against this nonsense. It's not popular, but someone's going to have to take a stand. Stand for the God of Israel. And know assuredly that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed Yeshua, Moshiach ben David. He, Jesus was the Messiah, the son of David, that was come to the world, that had to give his life in order to restore back the Spirit of God within us. My Jewish brethren, I speak to you with a sincerity in my heart. The only way we're going to come back, the only way redemption, gula, is going to be restored for us is when we see and recognize what God has done for us. When we believe and accept that Jesus indeed was Moshiach and that we we, we, we didn't, you know, in one way, I, I, don't, I don't want to say we did wrong, had we not offered him as a sacrifice, if our forefathers had not offered him as a sacrifice, where would we be? There would be no gula. There would be no redemption. And we had need of that redemption. We have, if Adam forfeited the very life of God by the sin in the Garden of Eden, him and Eve both, they forfeited the Spirit of God that dwelled within them. And this is why the carnal nature took over. This is why a man began to rule his wife. This is why we see all the carnality that took place in this life. 
God said to Eve, your husband shall rule over you and your, de your desire shall be to him. Why would her desire be to her husband? You know, I mean, in, in a lot of Christian realms, they say that, you know, the, the husband is to be the boss. So you're supposed to, you need to step up and be the man that you're supposed to be. You know what kind of man you're supposed to be? You're supposed to be a man filled with the spirit of Almighty God. And if you're filled with the spirit of Almighty God, you're not going to be up there with some club thinking you're supposed to be ruling and bossing around your house. If you and your wife both are filled with the spirit of Almighty God, what did Jesus come to do? He came to restore the relationship that was broken at the Garden of Eden. Adam was not bossing and ruling his wife and keeping her in line and this type of thing here. What was Adam doing? There was no need of it. If God says to Eve, your desire shall be to your husband, then undoubtedly her desire was not to her husband in the first place. Not to say that they weren't in love. Of course they were in love. They were partners. They were, they were soulmates. But her desire was to Hashem. And Adam was not ruling his wife. They, they had a, a, a beautiful love relationship. They were just in love with one another. But when the fall comes, the Spirit of God is removed from their lives. Carnality sets in. He's, he's bigger, so he's going to boss her now. And because he does represent strength, she looks up to him because the Spirit of God is no longer dwelling within her. She cannot communicate one-on-one -on -one with God any longer. No wonder why Cain kills Abel. Carnality had set in. That's what happened. Jesus came to restore back what was lost. My brethren, we need the Spirit of God. As Rabbi uh, um, Orda says, our hearts are like the Holy of Holies. And we need to prepare our hearts so that Shekinah can live in us. How are we going to get the Shekinah living in us? If it was forfeited in the Garden of Eden, David said, Let not thy spirit depart from me, O God. He didn't mean that it was living inside of his heart. But the presence of God was around him. If you can get it in your heart, it won't depart. And this is what Mashiach was supposed to do, was to come. He was supposed to be as Isaiah says of him. God says, I will form him, yea, I have created him. Just as he did Adam. But he was doing it in a womb to be a kinsman redeemer. And when the kinsman redeemer came, he gave his life willingly in order to what? In order to be opened up on Calvary, to be split as Adam was split, to pull out a bride for him. Christ was split not just to create a Gentile bride, but to restore back the life to all mankind that was, that was foreordained to this life. He came to redeem back that which was lost. And Israel is first. That is why you see the Jews take the, the Spirit of God upon them. If you're taking the Spirit upon you, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, then you are becoming one with your husband. When the Spirit of God comes with inside of you, you become one with your husband. And it was, it was Hashem's spirit that was inside of Jesus. So we become one with our husband. God is coming to redeem back his bride. And so he provokes us to jealousy with a people that are no people. And when Moses comes back on the scene, and if it is the case that the bride is still here and she goes just before Christ himself reveals himself to his people, Moses and Elijah are getting the people ready to recognize what we had lost, where we went wrong, what, you know, as, as Rabbi Winston says, what haven't we done right? The part we need to do right now is to recognize from the Torah that God had promised Moshiach to come. And he also said what would happen to him. This is what we have need of. This is what we need to recognize who Moshiach was. What did he come? Why did he come? He come to restore life. What life? The life that was lost in the Garden of Eden, which was the life of Hashem. You know it says, La nefesh chayim, for the soul was the life of Yahweh. 
and God taken from Ish, not Adam, from Ish, and He made Isha. The fire and the Spirit of God together. He created them. And Jesus, think about it, my brothers. Think about it. You, you know good and well, my Jewish brethren. You know good and well from what the rabbis have told, taught us through the, through, the, through the Midrash and through the Talmud. We read in there, we see that the Esh and, uh, is, is the fire and, 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 and Adam, Ish and Isha are made from the compound uh, or from the word fire and from the word yod Hey, spelling the first two letters in the divine name of Hashem. Why then? Why is it then that, that Adam, instead of calling her Isha any longer, he calls her after the fall Chava? And we say, okay, uh, you know, she, she brings forth life. It's flesh life. Where is the Yod? Why, why isn't it Chai? Chet Yod. Why is, it, why is it not there? Because the life of God is no longer there. They can bring forth children as God commanded them to multiply and replenish the earth. They're able to bring forth children, but not with life. We have need of life. And that life had to be, because it was forfeited in the Garden of Eden, God had to have a kinsman redeemer according to the law of Moses. This is why Jesus had to come. Moshiach has to come and die. Even if it's today, it would have, he would have to come and die. But look, we already know we're past that. We have to know we're past it. Why? Because Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, we're in our homeland. We've been scattered and we're regathered again. You know, when we were, when we, every time God scattered us as a nation, it was because of sin. And, and we sit there and we think, well, you know, why were we scattered back in 70 AD? Everybody wants to scratch our heads. The rabbis scratch our heads. What did, we, what did we do wrong? Well, you know, God doesn't scatter our people unless there's sin. So then let's go back and see where we went wrong then. There was a man that was there. There was a man that we didn't pay heed to. As the Bible says, as Moses says, we were unmindful of the rock. Yet that rock followed us around and give water of life, water of life, and that water of life was a representation of the Spirit of God that was to come in this day. What haven't we done right? We need to go back and find where we left God. Just like with David, you know, we wanted a king. We cried out. We didn't want Samuel the prophet. That, that's where we went wrong to start with. We rejected Samuel. Shimuel, you know that. We, we rejected him. Our people, our fathers rejected him. Didn't want a prophet. Wanted a king. Wanted to be like the rest of the world. Well, we got it again. We're back as a nation. And that is a divine ordinance of God. That God drove us back to our land. And that is God in it but he's taking us back the way we left him. The exact same way back. We've got to find out, okay, if you don't, if, as, as, as Jewish brethren, if you don't accept that Yeshua, Jesus is Moshiach ben David, then we need a Moshiach, and that Moshiach needs to be willing to give his life and lay it down, and he better have Chaim inside of him. You know, for our souls, the Nevesh Chaim, we need it. Because it's the only way for God to restore us back to life. We've got to have the life of God living within us. How are we going to go? How, are, how, how, can we have a, how can there be a resurrection? We believe in a resurrection, but how can we have a resurrection if there's no life in us to resurrect us? And yet we, we know, we know that, you know, do we really need God and may God to wake us up? No. That's not what wakes us up. God has that plan. We, we, we believe, I mean, Christians write in their Bible that there's two witnesses. And they, they, of course they argue over it. Elijah and Enoch is, is the popular view. Uh, Elijah and Moses is not the popular view. We ought to know enough though that it's Elijah and Moses. Because we, we, we already believe that Elijah is to return. We do we're not. We believe it. And how many rabbinical scholars believe right now that Moses, that he will actually be, when Moses returns, it'll actually, he'll, he'll, be, he'll, he'll be Moshiach himself. 
but, but it's not Moses is Moshiach, but yes, Moses does return. Rashi points this out when the song of Moses in Exodus uh, chapter 15. Asherah Adonai, I will sing unto the Lord. Something in the future, not, not then, not five minutes later after the victory there, but I will sing unto the Lord. And in the book of Revelation, we find out that John notices the same thing and said this group that comes across on the sea of glass, they sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. Wow, they recognize that there is a sacrifice. It must be Jews. And now we have a third exodus. We have the exodus of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. We have the exodus that, that um, Jeremiah speaks of in the 23rd chapter. Back from all over the world, back to the homeland. And then John speaks of an exodus. Where they go over the sea of glass that is mingled with fire. I don't think the Christians made a mistake when they translated it Red Sea. I believe it was speaking of the final exodus of our people. We come over the judgments of God. We will be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown in the fiery furnace to see if they really would stand for their God. And then there was a fourth man in there. When we believe that fourth man, I don't care if there's a Gog and a Magog, I don't care if there's an Armageddon. Let the bombs fall. We will walk through that fire. And we will walk over a sea of glass. We will walk over the judgments of Almighty God who will bring judgment on the nations. I kind of wonder if that's not speaking of the United Nations, besides all the Arab countries that can't stand our guts anyway. Uh, kind of interesting thought, I don't know. But anyway, we need to wake up ourselves. We need to quit condemning. Just, just, you know, if you have to turn your te television off, don't worry about the nonsense of, of, of ministers that are on there. I mean, we see plainly, according to, to, to when Moses goes to Midian, he's having to, you know, th these shepherds are coming in, driving back uh, these true Christians. They're being driven back from the well. And, and like I said, I believe that's, I, I agree with Dr. Chuck Missler. I believe it harmonically is kind of like types of church down through the ages. And, but these shepherds that believed in pagan gods, that's the interesting point, they believed in pagan gods. They didn't believe in just the God of Israel. You know, they didn't recognize that Moshiach, that God would be inside of him. Even, even the Christian Bible does write that God was in him, the fullness of God was in him, reconciling the world to himself. You know, that's, that's redemption. God bless you. And Christian friends, I'm not trying to condemn you by no means, but I see all kinds of nonsense out there. All kinds. Get back to the water. Get back to the Word of God. Open up your Bible. Search your Bible. Dress yourself in the Word of God. Don't, don't just ignore, ignore the shepherds that, that, are, that are believing in multiple gods. It's just nonsense. We don't need paganism. God has brought you into a marriage covenant with Israel. Joseph, his, two, his Asenath, and the two sons, was that a separate altogether issue? No. When his father Jacob came, they became part of Israel. I think the Christian Bible says something about you become a spiritual Jew. If you become a spiritual Jew, then how could you have a separate husband? That would make God your husband. Hashem, Yahweh. Christ came to restore back that life that was lost at the Garden of Eden. It would change your life. My Jewish brethren, it would change your life. And it's so easy to receive it. No wonder Jesus said, unless a man be born again, we're born in a fleshly body through corruption, through the sin that happened in the Garden of Eden. And the only way is to get the birth of the Spirit of Hashem, the Shekinah, living inside of us. And God hid that Shekinah inside of the Son of God called Jesus Christ. And when He died, His side was opened up. Water came forth showing that the water of life was in Him. The Spirit of God left, came out of His body. And on the day of Pentecost, there was the Aish, the fire, 
that just was over the tops of their heads. That age, that fire. But it was Yahweh's life. And it came inside of them. And they acted totally different from the way they acted originally. That's a new birth. That's being born again. It's getting the Spirit of God in us to create us as a new creature. God bless you, my brothers, my sisters. I love you.